Give me just one second, please. I'm trying to transform, flip, horizontal. There we go. Hey, now it looks like I'm looking at my code when I look over there. Okay, all right. Happy Wednesday and welcome to the stream, everybody. My name is Nick Larson. Today is January 15th, 2020. It is 1230 in the afternoon and we're going to have a short one today because I've got a bunch of mentoring to do this afternoon. Uh, what I really want to do, though, is get started with PyTorch. Um, in all of the deep learning stuff that I have done in the past, it has always been like sometimes uh, TensorFlow with a little bit of Keras mixed in. I've never really like spent the time to actually care about how the tools that implement that stuff worked. I've only cared about like the architecture of the thing, and and I need that to change for a project that I have coming up. Um, just to give you a, a very brief and general idea about what's going on, I'm about to dedicate this stream for the next like six months to reproducing a lot of work in reinforcement learning um, and deep reinforcement learning in particular. I've got a little bit of hardware here that I can actually run run some model stuff on, uh, and I've got I've got a little bit of time that I can let it run for. And I want to reproduce a couple of things that have been super interesting and super impactful, at least on like my understanding of the things. Uh, so to get started, we're just gonna take a look at PyTorch, see if we can get an environment set up and then uh, maybe do a really basic, a really basic something to make sure that it works. Okay, so step number one, PyTorch. Let me go create, there we go. Crush that over there. PyTorch, PyTorch, getting started. And no, I have never touched this before. I have never set this up before. And I am on Windows. Prerequisites, Windows 7, Windows 10. Yeah, I've got that, yay. I do have an NVIDIA GPU. Python. I use Anaconda for this, but I think I'm going to move away from Anaconda for the time being. Uh, let's just make sure that I actually have Python installed. Ooh, 2.7, Python 3, oh, wait, no, we're on Windows, so it's Pi 3, oh, forget how to do it now, virtual environment, hey, all right, we do have a virtual environment, so we can just create virtual environments, which is what we should be doing anyway, all right, let's get a, let's get a thing started. Oh yeah, my chatbot stopped working. I don't know if they like changed the API or whatever, but it's telling me that I am not authenticated or something like that. It's really, really strange. I don't know if they like deleted some deleted some keys or like what happened. Anyway. Let's go create a new folder. File close. Open folder. Ooh, man, that's a lot of stuff. Uh, let's go with... Um, yeah, experimental, I think. And then let's go with... Uh, new folder. Learn... PyTorch. All right. Nope, didn't want that. Yep, wanted that. Virtual environment. Let's get a little help on that. Okay, version. Nope, verbose, nope, Python, P. Okay. Uh, how do I know which versions of Python I have installed? 
that's a great question. Let's go to code. Let's go to tools. Nope. Let's go to C program files. Python. Python 3.5. You know what? Let's just. Is there a way to list? I'm going to look that up. Okay, Windows list Python versions. I guess you don't like that query. How to check all the installed Python versions. I got the answer by typing PyH, which tells me that zero, not the letter O. Okay, let's try that. Ah, it's Py. Aha. Okay. Yay. All right. There we go. Installed Python's found. Three, seven, four, three, five. What's the latest? Let's just go ahead and install the latest. Three, seven, four. Great. Okay. So now we're going to say uh, virtual environment p 3.7. Okay. Oh, Python 3.7. And virtual environment options destination the environment Python 3.7 does not exist it's because it's anaconda Okay, Anaconda. I should probably like uninstall these two. These can't be useful since I'm on Anaconda. Who makes Anaconda? Help about created by Anaconda. Anaconda? Ooh. Program files? What? 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 Ana properties. Uh, yeah, open file location. Properties. Program data. Oh God, I don't understand it. All right, it's not critical. Let's make Let's make a new one. Python 3.7 Learn PyTorch.
Oh, great. Open a terminal. Hey, all right. Now we can say I CD experimental uh, learn code dot. Okay, there we go. All right. Step one. Installation. You'll need to open the Anaconda prompt to install PyTorch via Anaconda. And you do have a CUDA capable system. In the above selector, choose OS, Windows package, Conda, and the CUDA version suited to your machine. Conda, CUDA, oh, here it is. Install PyTorch Torch Vision CUDA Toolkit. I have 10.1, great. Okay, so we're going to copy this, and inside here, we're going to run that. Feels like it, huh? <laughs> no, I am not. It is taking way longer than I thought it would, though. Yeah, so I don't know uh, how long you've been here, but uh, to sort of catch you up on what my plan is, why I'm interested in this at all, is... Uh, I'm going to start reproducing a bunch of work that's been done in reinforcement learning recently, at least as much as I, I can with the hardware that I have, because a lot of it uses really specialized hardware. Um, and then as soon as, as soon as I get that done, I'm going to see if I can start applying it to some new stuff that I'm interested in. It feels like it got stuck. I don't know why, but I really thought this would be like a 10 second thing, like it normally is when you install Python. Oh, there it goes. Um, and then, and then, yeah, so that's how I got started. And uh, a lot of the examples and a lot of the tools that I've been finding online for deep reinforcement learning use PyTorch instead of TensorFlow or whatever else. And I know that, uh, I know that they are are mostly about like here's the architecture of the thing and you can replicate it in either one but i've never really taken the time to like dedicate 
effort into learning like Keras and how it works and how all the pieces fit together. Um, and, uh, and so I decided PyTorch is the one I'm going to do. So that's where we're at. Okay. The following new packages will be installed. Looks like it's done. Let's do a what? A pip list. Yeah, torch, torch vision. All right, all right, look at all this stuff. Perfect. Okay. Let's make a thing. All right, we have it installed. Let's go to what? Tutorials then? PyTorch Blitz. Sure. Let's just watch it. PyTorch is one of the most popular open source deep learning. Oh, let's make it some. Frameworks. Both researchers and developers use PyTorch because it provides. No, I don't use Python very often. I don't use it for work. We use R mostly um, and, and C Sharp. And uh, I used it quite a bit in college. I really like the syntax of it. I really like that it, it flows very well with um, like the natural way that I think about solving problems, uh, meaning mostly like pseudocode. And then, and then the one issue that I have with it is that like, I generally tend to think in terms of like bits and bytes and mapping that to like Python concepts, very, very difficult, largely. So that's my only gripe about it. But other than that, I really like the syntax. I really like the language. It's everybody like uses it at some point. So there's tons of information out there. Lots and lots and lots of packages, lots of, lots of everything. fast, flexible experimentation, and a seamless transition to production deployment. PyTorch is built to use the power of GPUs for faster training and is deeply integrated into Python, making it easy to get started. One of the best ways to get started with PyTorch is by going through the tutorial, Deep Learning with PyTorch, a 60-minute list, authored by Samit Chintala. Upon completion of this tutorial, you'll understand what PyTorch and neural networks are and be able to build and train a small neural network that can classify images. Keep in mind that this tutorial assumes that you have a basic familiarity with NumPy, a Python library for scientific computing. All of the modules in the 60-minute list have links to Google Colab, so you can immediately run code and get hands-on experience with PyTorch. You can also download the notebooks and run them locally. Now, let's take a look at the topics we'll cover in the Blitz. The tutorial is broken out into four different modules. In the first module, What is PyTorch? You'll learn the fundamental technical details of PyTorch, such as tensors and multiple syntaxes of operations. In the second module, you'll learn about automatic differentiation through a PyTorch package called Autograd. In the third module, you'll follow a typical procedure for training a neural network by defining the neural network, computing the loss, and propagating gradients back into the network's parameters. Finally, you'll get to put what you learned in the first three modules into a real-life example, training an image classifier to automatically label images. Let's get started. Okay, let's get started. Make sure you have Torch and Torch Vision packages installed. What is PyTorch? What is PyTorch? It is a Python-based scientific computing package targeted at two sets of audiences, a replacement for NumPy to use the power of GPUs, a deep learning research platform that provides maximum flexibility and speed. Tensors. Let's make a file. Uh, module one. Great. Okay. It is. Tensors are similar to NumPy's ND arrays, with the addition being that tensors can also be used on a GPU to accelerate computing. Okay. An uninitialized matrix is declared but does not contain definite known values before it is used. When an uninitialized matrix is created, whatever values were in the allocated memory at the time will appear as the initial values. That seems dangerous. 
construct a five by three matrix torch dot empty five by three print three. Let's just type it. X equals torch dot empty. Where's my autocomplete? Five by three print X. And then maybe instead of doing this in here, we can do this in a Jupyter notebook where I can just run these things. Jupyter install Jupyter conda install okay where is this do it that's a lot of stuff What is Jupiter Lab? Okay. How about install the notebook? open source web application that allows you to create and share documents that contain live code, equations, visualization, and narrative text. Uses include. Okay. Jupyter's next gen notebook interface is a web-based interactive development environment for Jupyter Notebooks code. Jupyter Lab is flexible. Configure and arrange the user interface to support a wide range of flows. So I installed Jupyter Lab. How do I start it? Where's the getting started for this one? Getting started. Installation. Starting Jupiter Lab. Jupiter Lab. Okay. Uh, Jupiter. Password or token? The F? Oh, there it is. Okay. Sweet. Module one. That's cool. Terminal 
text file, console, notebook. That's what I want, a notebook. Uh, we want to rename that notebook. Rename. Rename. Module 1. Okay. Perfect. Let's put this over here. Zoom in so people can see. Zoom in. Okay. All right. Did I run it? I'm not entirely sure. That's it, we're gonna type. Okay, x equals torch dot empty five three print x hey it zeroed it out I wasn't expecting that okay construct a randomly initialized matrix x equals torch dot rand five three Print X. Okay. Great. Construct a matrix filled with zeros of D type long. X equals torch dot zeros of five three D oops D type equals torch dot long. X. Okay. Construct a tensor directly from data. X equals torch dot tensor five point five and three. Print X. Okay. Or create a tensor based on an existing tensor. These methods will reuse properties of the input tensor, for example, dtype, unless new values are provided by the user. x equals x dot new ones five three dtype equals torch dot double print x new star methods take in sizes It doesn't make sense to me like what the x is there at all like why we're calling a function on an existing tensor and like creating totally new one that has nothing to do with the first one like none of these values not the shape nothing is used so that one's a little misleading for me x equals torch dot rand in like x d type equals torch dot float print x okay so this one takes the same shape that makes sense to me changes the type to float also makes sense to me okay Get a size. Print x dot size. That's just like just like a numpy array. Is 
size is in fact a tuple, so it supports all tuple operations. Okay, great. Operations. There are multiple syntaxes for operations. In the following example, we will take a look at the addition operation. Sure. Y equals torch dot rand five three print x plus y. Cool. Also makes sense. Okay. Print of torch dot add. Oops, oh, behind my head. Ha <laughs> ha. Torch dot add x y. All right, same result. So this is just like NumPy, where you can say like NumPy dot dot instead of multiplying them. This makes sense. All right, addition, providing an output tensor as an argument. Ah, memory saving. Torch dot add x, no, result equals torch dot empty x. No, that would have been way too easy. Torch dot, what was the one we used up here? New ones. Torch dot new one dot ones. X dot size. Ooh. Print result. Hey, all right, okay. Fun. Let's go with um, torch dot add x y out equals result. Cool. And then if I say print result, yes. All right. This is this is good. That one was a little interesting in how it actually printed it out. Addition in place. Y dot add underscore. Okay. And then if I say Y from now on. then we end up with the same thing. Okay. Any operation that mutates a tensor in place is postfixed with an underscore. For example, copy x dot translate, tra trans, what is it called? Translate, okay. You can use standard NumPy like indexing with all the bells and whistles. Great. Rand in x dot view 16. Resizing. If you want to resize, reshape your tensor, you can use torch dot view. That's interesting. Uh, x equals torch dot rand. In, I'm guessing that's rand normal. Four four. Y equals x dot view sixteen. What the hell is y? Oh, that's wild. It's just a vector. That's no, it's not a vector. It is a tensor that has what
x dot size. Oh no, it is. It's just a vector that's 16 long. Interesting. The size minus 1 is inferred from other dimensions. Oh, so this is like reshape. Okay. Okay, I can deal with that. Reshape, sounds good. If you have one element tensor, use dot item to get the value as a Python number. So x of uh, what, zero comma zero. Is a tensor with a single value. And so if we say x of zero comma zero dot item, aha, uh -huh. perfect. Okay. Read later. 100 plus tensor operations, including transposing, that's what it's called, transposing, indexing, slicing, mathematical operations, linear algebra, random numbers, etc., are described here. That's our read later. Okay, I'll allow it. NumPy bridge, converting a torch tensor to a NumPy array and vice versa is a breeze. The torch tensor and NumPy array will share the underlying memory locations. If the torch tensor is on CPU and changing one will change the other. That's cool. Okay. A equals torch dot ones of five. Okay b equals a dot numpy uh, print b cool a dot add underscore one ooh print a print b Yes, okay, that's cool. Something to be wary of. Out. This thing right here, if the torch tensor is on CPU. I wonder if there is a control F CPU. device how do I know what the device is okay whatever Okay. Maybe let's switch these. Okay. NumPy add. Okay. Converting NumPy array to a torch tensor. Import NumPy as NP. Okay, a equals np dot ones of five. Uh, b equals torch dot from numpy of a. np dot add a one out equals a. Print a 
different B. Okay. 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 CUDA tensors. If torch.cuda dot is available, let's try that. If torch.cuda dot is available. device equals torch dot device CUDA Y equals torch dot ones like X device equals device X equals X dot two device Z equals X plus Y print Z print Z dot two CPU torch dot torch dot double Hey Crazy. Crazy. All right, what's next? Autograd. Is this uh, module two? This must be module two, right? Table of contents. Well, that didn't really help. A 60 minute blitz. That's what I meant. Okay, Autograd. And then the third one is neural networks and then training a classifier. Okay, Autograd. All right, let's go with a uh, plus a notebook. Module two. Rename module two. Automatic differentiation. Central to all neural networks in PyTorch is the autograd package. Is the autograd package. Let's first briefly visit this and then we will go to training our first neural network. The autograd package provides automatic differentiation for all operations on tensors. It is a define by run framework, which means that your backprop is defined by how you by how your code is run and that every single iteration can be different. And that every single iteration can be different. Okay, whatever that means. Let us see this in more simple terms with some examples. Tensor. Torch.tensor is central class of the package. If you set its attribute to requires grad as true, it starts to track all operations on it. When you finish your computation, you can call backward and have all the gradients computed automatically. The gradient for this tensor will be accumulated into grad.grad .grad attribute. Okay. 
To stop a tensor from tracking history, you can call detach to detach it from a computation history and prevent further computation from being tracked. To prevent tracking history and using memory, you can also wrap the code block in with torch.nograd. This can be particularly helpful when evaluating a model because the model may have trainable parameters with requires grad equals true, but for which we don't need the gradients. There's one more class which is very important for autograd implementation, a function. Tensor and function are interconnected and build up an acyclic graph that encodes a complete history of computation. Each tensor has a grad function attribute that references a function that has created the tensor. Except for tensors created by the user, their grad function is none. If you want to compute the derivatives, you can call dot backward on a tensor. If tensor is a scalar, that is, it holds a one element data. You don't need to specify any arguments to backward. However, if it has more elements, you need to specify a gradient argument that is a tensor matching of matching shape. Wow, we're going to learn a lot. Let's do this. import torch x equals torch dot ones uh, two two requires grad equals true print x okay do a tensor operation y equals x plus two print y Ah. Y was created as a result of an operation, so it has a grad function. Print Y dot grad fund. Okay, add backward object. Do more operations on Y. Z equals Y times Y times 3. Out equals Z dot mean. Print Z out. Twenty-seven, twenty-seven. Twenty seven multiply backward tensor is a mean backward. Okay. Requires grad underscore changes the existing tensors require grad flag in place. The input flag defaults to false if not given. Rand in to two a equals a times three divided by a minus one print a dot requires grad a dot requires grad true print a dot requires grad b equals a times a a dot sum print b dot grad function false true sum backward Crazy. Okay, let's let's use this thing. 
let's back prop now because out contains a single scalar out dot backward is equivalent to out dot backward torch dot tensor one dot print x dot grad okay okay x was one one out what is out 27 you should get a matrix of 4.5 let's call the out tensor O we have that O equals 1 fourth of the sum, this really needs to be increased in size, if at all possible. Of course it doesn't do that, because that would be way too easy. Math settings, zoom factor, 400. Accessibility. Nope. Oh, just all the time on hover. Zoom factor, what the hell? Okay, well, I'm just going to have to try to look at this. All right, O equals one-fourth. Oh, shit. That's how it works. All right, O equals one-fourth the sum of each element in Z. Z is a tensor of 27s, that all makes sense, and ZI is not 27s, it's 3 times the elements of XI plus 2 squared. Okay. ZI given xi equals 1 equals 27. Therefore, the derivative of O with respect to x the derivative of O with respect to x is 3 halves xi plus 2 well, that actually makes sense. Okay, so given xi equals one, you have nine over two, you get 4.5. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. All right, autograd, cool. Automatically, uh, mathematically, if you have a vector valued function y given f of x, then the gradient of y with respect to X is a Jacobian matrix derivative of Y1 
with respect to derivative of x1, derivative of y1 with, with respect to derivative of xn. Yeah, okay. Generally speaking, torch.autograd is an engine for computing vector Jacobian product. That is, given any vector, compute a product vt times Jacobian, okay? If v happens to be the gradient of a scalar function, then by the chain rule, the vector Jacobian product would be the gradient of L with respect to X. Okay. Note that the vector of t no, vector transpose times j gives a row vector which can be treated as a column vector by taking the transpose of j times v. This is this characteristic of a vector Jacobian product makes it very convenient to feed external gradients into a model that has non-scalar output. Now let's take a look at an example of vector Jacobian product. Okay. X equals torch dot rand in three requires grad equals true. Y equals X times two while Y dot data dot norm less than 1000 y equals y times 2 print y okay Now in this case, y is no longer a scalar. Torch.autograd could not compute the full Jacobian directly, but if we just want the vector Jacobian product, simply pass the vector to backward as an argument. Interesting. Vector equals torch dot tensor zero point one one point zero zero point zero zero one zero 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 one D type equals torch dot float Y dot backward V print x dot grad. Interesting. You can also stop autograd from tracking history on tensors with requires grad equals true Awkwardly hot.
Okay. You can also stop autograd from tracking history on tensors with dot requires grad equals true either by wrapping the code block in with torch dot no grad You can also stop autograd from tracking history on tensors with dot requires grad equals true. Exponentiate two dot requires grad with torch dot no grad print x x two exponentiate two dot requires grad. What? True, true, false, okay. Or by using detach. Okay. Print x dot requires grad y equals x dot detach print y dot requires grad print x dot equal y dot all okay okay document about autograd dot function is here. Cool. Neural networks, my, my. Module three. I felt like I clicked that. Did I click that? I felt like I clicked that. There it is. Rename module three. Okay. Neural networks can be constructed using the torch.in in package. Now that you've had a glimpse of autograd, in in depends on autograd to define models and differentiate them. An in in dot module contains layers and a method forward input that returns the output. For example, look at this network that classifies digit images. Okay. It is a simple feed forward network. It takes the input, feeds it through several layers, one after the other, and then finally gives an output. A typical training procedure for neural networks is as follows. Define a neural network that has some learnable parameters or weights, iterate over a data set of inputs, 
process input through the network, compute the loss, how far is the output from being correct, propagate gradients back into the network's parameters, update the weights of the network, typically using a simple update rule, weight equals weight minus learning rate times gradient. Define the network. Okay, let's get to typing. I do want to type this out because I think I feel like I learn better when it's like a repetition thing. Import torch.nn as nn. Import torch.nn.functional as f. Class net nn dot module def in it self super net self dot in oh man that's a lot of stuff okay one input image channel Six output channels three by three square convolution. Is there a way to collapse this? Hey, all right, there we go. Okay, cool. Um, kernel self dot convolution one equals nn dot com two d one six three self dot convolution two equals neural network dot convolution two d six sixteen three An affine operation y equals wx plus b self dot fc one equals n n dot linear sixteen times six times six one hundred and twenty. Six by six from image dimension. Self dot FC two equals in in dot linear one hundred and twenty eighty four. Self dot FC three equals in in dot linear eighty four ten. Def forward self x max pooling over a two two window. So this stuff right here is definitely like out of out of my wheelhouse. I'm looking at this image and I'm like, okay, so we have a convolution, right? I don't know what the 163 is, and I don't know how to get help. Show contextual help? That's all I had to do? Hey. That's cool. Yes, please. Okay, so in channels. Okay. One. Two. 
out channels, six. Kernel size, three. One input image channel. Six output channels. A three by three square convolution. Well, it makes sense that this six goes to this and the 16 it doesn't make sense to me how this is getting smaller oh uh, the convolutional layers generalize the idea of layers in a black white rgg image okay it's it's not super clear to me like the convolutional layer is saying that there's one input channel and six output channels i guess i don't understand that because to me i'm thinking of like the input is an image that's like you know 32 by 32 and i know what a convolution is right it's like a, a subsection of the image that we are combining together Right, 32 by 32 by 1. So we're somehow turning 32 by 32 into a smaller size where all of the nearby pixels combine together, but we're doing it six times? Oh, interesting. Okay, so this image starts to make a lot more sense now. So you have one input image. You're generating six different feature maps. Okay, which makes sense to me. And the reason it goes to 28 by 28 is because... Why would it not go to 30 by 30? No, because the first one, yeah. Yeah, why would it not go to 30 by 30? Because the first one starts in the top left corner and you can move over 30 times. So that doesn't quite make sense to me, but I guess that's not that big of a deal. The 28 by 28 is a little past me. Maybe it has something to do with how you go from 28s to... Okay, so you have six input channels and you want 16 output channels. Oh, this makes even less sense to me now. Which means it loses the corners and side always since it can't make a full convolution over the edge unless you add padding. That's correct. Yeah, that makes total sense to me. And I know about all the different ways to like add padding all the different like mathematical and statistical ways to add padding. Yeah. All right. So you go from here. What the hell is this layer? So with default padding equals zero, that's why it goes from 32 to 28. Oh, 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 wait, it's not a three by, th uh, wait, the way that I'm imagining this is like, give a really quick example here, is like, you've got your pixels, Oh, 
like this, you can have a three by three here, a three by three here, a three by three here, a separate three by three here, another one here, another one here, and another one here, right? So for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, we would have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, which makes sense to me. You would lose a little bit, but it doesn't apply it on any of the corners since you're not doing the padding. So the first one isn't, uh, let me just add a layer. So the, the your, your corners or sides, it doesn't go all the way to the edge. Like the first, the first three by three square doesn't go like, uh, give me a block, give me a full, the first three by three square doesn't go to, and give me some alpha. It would be like that. And then from here, wouldn't it do this one? And then this one, and then this one, and then this one, and then that one, and then that one. I still don't understand then how you're losing them. There is a parameter for stride, which lets you jump. Oh, is there like a default that's just not like in here? Stride equals one. Oh shit. Stride controls the stride for the cross correlation, a single number or tuple. Okay. The subsampling doesn't appear to be in here either. I can understand how you go from 28 by 28 to 14 by 14. That makes total sense to me. The 14 by 14 to 10 by 10. Oh, you know what? This is both dropping by four each time. Three by three square convolution. Kernel size. I think the subsampling comes in the forward function. You don't write out the full thing yet. Okay. Subsampling. Uh, kernel size. Can I can I control F in here? Because that would be way too easy. Kernel size. Oh yes. A single int in which case the same value is used for the height and width dimension, right? That makes sense. What is the output size? What is the output size of a three by three convolution over a thirty two by thirty two image? Whoa, what just happened right there? How to calculate the size of an output of a convolutional layer. There are three main parameters to be tweaked to modify the behavior of a convolutional layer. The parameters are the filter size, stride, and zero padding. Oh, is there a padding? Padding zero. Dilation?
the size the filter size is the kernel size okay all right so we're not padding we have a stride of one we have a dilation what is dilation con two dilation I, it's got to be it's it has to be this one dilated convolution two dilated convolution four dilated convolution I've never seen dilation, no idea whatsoever. NumPy results is an eight by eight. See, that's what I would have expected as well. Is the dilation basically blocking together the values so that one value in the filter corresponds to more than one value in the image input? From from these pictures, I believe the answer is yes. That a dilated convolution This is a three by three kernel. Don't know what the application that has, but I guess it's good to know. Yeah. See, so this is a ten by ten. Was it? Maybe it wasn't. Oh, there you go. That's what dilated convolution looks like. That's what the kernel ends up looking like. Yeah, I don't know what the what the idea of that is. Okay, so not dilation. Where was I? How to calculate the size. Stride is 1, the output volume will be a 5 by 5. On the other hand, if we increase the stride to be 2, the output volume reduces to a 3x3. Three three. Stride is normally set. Yes, I totally understand that. That makes total sense. The formula to be used to measure the padding value and get the spatial size of the input and output volume to be the same with stride 1 on the other hand, if we use stride equals one, padding equals one, then the output size would be 198 times 198. Right, that makes it... Okay, I'm not going to worry about it at this moment because I want to get through this example in the amount of time that I have, which is six and a half minutes. And then I will come back and try to understand why this is like it is. Yep, that's what I'm going to do. Okay.
forward. Uh, x equals f dot max pool 2d f dot rectified linear unit self dot convolution 1 of x 2 by 2 if the size is a square you can only specify a single number. X equals F dot max pool 2D F dot rectify linear unit of self dot convolutional 2 X uh, 2 2 x equals x dot view minus one self dot num flat layers which I don't remember specifying anywhere which must just be in the net okay num flat layers of x x equals f dot rectified linear unit of self dot fc1 x x equals f dot rel u self dot fc2 of x x equals self dot fc3 of x return x def num flat features self x size equals x dot size all dimensions except the batch dimension that sort of makes sense num features equals one for s in size num features oh num features equals times equals s return num features feels like that's something you don't need to calculate repeatedly net equals net you have two typos in your forward function um, mm -hmm. uh, x equals f dot max pool 2 d f rel u self dot convolution one of x comma two two max pool oh num flat layers oh features thank you num flat features And the one is capitalizing the X before return. Oh, man, that, is, that one would have been hard to catch. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, equals net print net. All right. Seems to take it. Okay, you have just... All right, actually, I'm going to bail on this. Uh, I'm going to pause it right here because I have to get on a call, a mentorship call in about a minute and a half. Um, and I don't think I'm going to finish this up and understand it in that time. Maybe I will do one more here. Params equals list net dot parameters print len of params 
print params zero dot size convolution ones dot weight ten torch dot size super interesting okay yeah uh thank you so much uh for hanging out and definitely for catching those uh those typos i would have banged my head against the wall for it i'm sure um but uh yeah i gotta run i will be back tomorrow at right at right at noon i think maybe maybe a little afternoon it's been a busy week it's going to continue being a busy week um, but I'll be I'll be around like noon or twelve thirty tomorrow. So if you're around, please do stop by again, and I really appreciate it. And uh, hopefully I see you tomorrow. All right, have a good one.